calls from I am Calcutta, I am Ahmedabad, MDI, Utah, all of them, that job situation is extremely weak. Please come and help us. I used to go to I am Calcutta regularly every year for giving placement talks and recruiting. During 80s and maybe very early 90s. Thereafter, we found boys and girls from I am uh, no more interested. So we decided to do with so-called second-tier management schools, business schools. And we adopted a policy of advertising in newspapers and have that process. So last year when the business schools, I mean, absolute top-notch business schools, including my alma mater, they rang me up. I unfortunately could not mobilize them at all because I said, look, our advertisement are already out, we have received applications, the process is on. So today if I go to campus, then I'll hand take people, then what do I do with my entire process? I cannot just, you know, discard the process in the middle way, that's not fair. So next year, which is the coming year, we will definitely go to the campus. The only problem is that, you know, as Jayanto said, that there is a belief amongst today's, and because there in our time it has only increased many folds amongst today's youngsters that unless you keep job hopping, you cannot go up fast. And that is even more amongst the you know, business school graduates, particularly from the so called premier institutions. So while this year we have taken a policy decision that we will go to IIMs, MBI, etc. But we are not very sure that how much we will be able to retain them. And today, as I also admitted, that the difference in salary between public sector and private sector has become far larger. <coughs> Having said that, one thing I will mention, you know, some of my colleagues, when, you know, uh, I mean, time to time, they say that, you know, public sector salary is so, so small, parts get so much more than us, etc. I don't, don't think I am preaching or anything, but I have always told them that look, why do you compare yourself with that point five percent or less of the citizenship of your motherland? You are better off than 99% of the population. Number two, even with our salary, I would very strongly say that we haven't had any difficulty in meeting more than in rearing up, rearing up our children, okay, maybe we can't go abroad with our family every year and things like that. But other than that, I think in Indian context, there is no difficulty in, you know, living a good life with public sector salary. And another thing, just because of course uh, this topic uh, has come up now, another thing I will always said that in public sector, no one is your with an inverted comma boss. Everyone is only a superior officer. Today I happen to be the chairman or managing director, but even when I was a middle level you know, executive, I knew that I am an employee and the chairman and managing director is nothing but another employee. So I have full liberty of expressing my views and as long as they were expressed in you know decent way, I was absolutely sure that that will have no adverse repercussion. In private sector and more so in India, you know, in India, large number of private sector companies are family. -made. I will not like to name, but uh, I am told, even by my ex colleagues that in certain organizations, you know, absolutely largest in the country and things like that, there the family, their behavior is you know, far from being desirable with the professionals many a times. There are no exceptions. If you look at, let's talk of data, it's a total exception. Data in many ways people say that they are you know, just as, just like a public sector in their processes and in many, many things. If you look at, let's say, L&T, that's again 
almost you can say semi public sector in the sense financial institutions own the largest chunk and even the even the employees they own quite i think 15% or something of the total state so these are these are exceptions rather than rules in india in private sector you know i personally feel of course i don't have a direct experience i have never worked in any organization or than sci but i do feel that in the private sector you can be in difficulty in many ways which are absolutely not in researchable in policy right from uh, pure onwards which of course we in sci we take a lot of pride in saying that we completely follow an open door policy and as long as i am not busy in other meetings i don't i mean i'm not that i do do travel quite a lot uh, maybe almost 10 15 days in a month but as long as i am not traveling i'm not busy in another meeting any employee of sci can simply drop in and see i would rather welcome them so this kind of culture are prevalent i'm sure in very very few public uh, private sector companies i'm sure i mean in reliance you know very few of up to at least middle level professionals they get to meet in case or any so public sector has its pluses public sector has its minuses and as they always say there is nothing in the world which is white or black everything is green it's only matter of you know gray and intensity so i have enjoyed it this this much i can say i have enjoyed working for public sector during my entire career i have got i don't know how many offers from private sector both indian and foreign and at any point of time when such offers came in terms of pure emoluments they were not less than 3 times sometimes more than 10 times of my then dwelling salary but it is not only i who decided not to share because i always felt sci has always been good to me my bosses have been good to me i have never had any problem but uh, my entire family they were totally against my even considering living in sci you know sci has one good thing which is not there in too many private sectors is there but in very very few that some of our let's say medical covers they cover not only yourself but your entire family so much so that of course my parents are no more but my parents when they have heart attacks they got hospitalized and they are underwent treatment for quite a quite a number of days i have never known what has been the experience never had any clue because nothing ever came to me and in sci of course this is again i would say it depends on personality in sci in calcutta where i worked for more than 20 years we had a so in those days that position is to be called regional director sci calcutta whenever anyone fell sick not only an employee but he is a and his wife or something a very dear relation he used to drop roasters as to how the colleague should go and spend the 24 hours with him so that the family is not burdened so this kind of thing is not you know not prevalent in you know i am sure in most of the private sectors so everything has got its pluses and minuses but what you are saying is correct I have been saying this again and again to the policy makers that if you look at public sector today, you will find many of them being headed by you know headed by persons from IITs and IIMs. So obviously, at one time, till about maybe 70s, early 80s, public sector attracted very good talents. but unfortunately with the sort of explosion in salaries in the private sector that is not happening and i have always maintained that
that that is the biggest challenge for public sector. Because today, any industry in the world is so-called knowledge industry. So basically, without you know, without good personnel, no organization can ever progress. So obviously, that is a very big challenge for public sector. And if I may say so, such economic downturn actually helps public sector to some extent. And once again, reminding people of stability. Because after all, everything in life has got its own value. Please. Sir, have you ever experienced political interference in the in your career while working in this public sector unit? When I was a young lad, when I joined public sector and, and worked for some time, I was told, of course, the designations have completely changed. Today we have uh, you know, we have adopted somewhat American system that we are having now PGM, GM, Vice President, Senior Vice President, Executive Director, and then Board Level Director and Chairman. In earlier days, it was GM and GGM. That is, below board it was called GGM and below that as GGM. So I was told when I was young man by many that you can at best aspire to become GM or GGM in the organization unless you have again so called political pushes and you know pulls etc. You cannot go up beyond that. Now all that I can say I never had any political pushes. <laughs> I have become director in SCI, I have become chairman in SCI without any push or pull and purely through the so called public enterprise selection board interviews. I have appeared for the interviews along with my colleagues and again many other uh, persons from other public sector organizations. And some of the grace of the board got selected and became whatever I became. Now if you are asking if there are any governmental interferences, of course there are, there is no question of that. But it all depends on how you tackle it. I keep getting in whether it is for uh, whether it is for job, whether it is for transfer, whether it is for advertisements. I keep getting phone calls, letters from MPs, ministers, and you know, 99 out of 100 times I don't do anything with that. In one or two cases, when I feel that it is important for SCI also to you know have a build up a relationship, rapport. After all, this is nothing unique for public sector. I remember it was uh, one of the ministers, again, why should I name him? I should not name him. In a spoke meeting, he mentioned that he finds it very odd that public sector CMDs, CEOs, spend so much of time in Delhi lobbying for their projects, lobbying for various things. Now, I find, because I do go to Delhi almost every week, I find that there are possibly three private sector executives for every one public sector executive who is moving around the corridors of power. So it is not that lobbying is done only by public sector and if the system requires lobbying, you have to lobby. Lobbying is there in USA, lobbying is there, I mean, in Europe, lobbying is there everywhere. And, you know, again, if you are talking, if you are meaning you are talking of corruption or all those things, I mean, as CMD of SCI, again, without uh, maybe being too modest, not being immodest, but without being too modest, I may say that I took over in 2005. So from 2005 to 2009, we have placed orders for 36 vessels. And between 95 and 2005, just to give you a, that's a, that's a good case all through, but just to give you a perspective. 95 and 2005, SCI had placed order for about 10 vessels. Now this is the this is the largest purchase for a shipping company, that's the vessels, which runs into millions and millions of dollars. At the moment, our order book stands at about 32 vessels of I mean, the price at 1.6 billion dollars. Now, there were fillers, there were pressures, but I have simply maintained that we go by so-called the 
this is all, you know, I will mention a little bit, CDC, etc. We completely follow absolute transparent global tendering process and go by L1. So I have said that, uh, you know, I mean, we go by L1. So, that, I mean, how can a, a shipyard, firstly, we have ordered only ships on the world's, you know, the best and the largest shipyards. How can a shipyard which knows that they have already quoted the most competitive price be asked to pay any under the table money because they have already asked to be a lower. So it all depends on and what happens, this is not only in public sector, it's everywhere. What happens is for you know undue gains, it is the you know top people of various organizations who try to, you know, sort of raise the arms of the politicians. And then that starts becoming more and more as a system. But then I am sure that if you, if you want, you can definitely fight the system there is an, and succeed. Because even today, the number of the percentage of honest Bureaucrats at least, I, won't, I don't know about, much about politicians, I won't like to comment, but bureaucrats, the percentage of bureaucrats who are completely honest is much higher than the dishonest bureaucrats. And in India, the systems are still so strong that even if a minister wants to do something, you'll find it almost impossible to do. There was a problem at the time of my appointment as, a, as, as the chairman. So the then chairman of public enterprise selection board, Mr. Baskaran, had commented to a friend of mine who had just asked him, by the way, that the other is not getting appointed. He said the way PESD has, uh, you know, uh, sort of put forward the fight for Mr. Hajra, no one can stop his appointment. So today our seven system is still very strong. There are enough number of very honest bureaucrats. So I don't think these are all concerns which can at least be complete, you know, roadblock for PSUs. Coming back. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, in your tenure, you have seen many governments fall and rise. So uh, what are the different government attitudes towards the uh, public sector, especially if you are taking into consider SCI specifically? Are there any different considerations from different governments? that have been there. Uh, I read in the paper that uh, uh, the present government, uh, Congress uh, specifically is more focused towards development than the previous government. So what is the difference in the government? See, I really strongly feel that in terms of economic policy, there is very little to choose between whether it is UPA or NDA. And, you know, it is, of course, from Anwar saying this is an exception. But it is the economic advisors and the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Finance and other ministries who drive the policy, not the government. And that is why, very fortunately for India, in the last at least 10, 15, 20 years, the economic policy has remained more or less the same. Okay. For a coalition government, there will be some compulsions. You can't help it. Earlier it was left. Today, I have heard today, as you all know, it's Mamta, who is creating a lot of problems. But then, that is that is our democracy. And I, for one again, just on the topic of democracy, you know, I have told many, in many different fora, that I am sure, not even vast majority, but 99% of Indians, will favor the Indian growth rate and Indian system rather than the Chinese growth rate and the Chinese system. So democracy has its scale plus and minus. Because obviously democracy is slow. You have just one party control which is supreme, then definitely you can drive home anything very, very much faster. But then I do believe that for various reasons, again it's a different topic, I mean, democracy being one of them, and democracy being another most important. I think in India, the growth is far more sustainable than in China. 
and that is why I do believe that China is miles and miles ahead of us. But maybe, maybe you know, I don't know when, 2015, 2017, but one, one of the one of the days in this century itself, India will not only catch up but will definitely surpass. PSU control structure. All the PSUs have their administrative ministries for us in the shipping ministry. But there is no direct chain of command. I mean, I do not report in that sense to the Secretary Shipping. We are, I mean, above Secretary, there is a Minister of State. Above the Minister of State, there is a Central I mean, Union Cabinet Minister. But there is no reporting structure. But I mean, just to take your question, there are definitely administrative controls which gradually are being relaxed. I remember my predecessor having said that for every foreign trip of the chairman or director, because for anybody else, for the last I don't know how many, maybe, maybe since inception of SCI in 61, chairman is the ultimate authority for sanctioning foreign trip. But only for the board directors and chairman, it was the ministry and the minister who was the sanctioning authority for any foreign trip. I mean, if you ask me, it has no logic, but it, is, it has been there, I believe. And my predecessor, Mr. P. K. Srivastava, he had calculated it and he had told us that for every foreign trip of a director or chairman, 38 signatures are required in the ministry. Now, as it stands today, of course, there are austerity measures and all those things in place. But as it stands today, the chairman is authorized to sanction up to six trips in a year for the directors. You may argue six trips are not adequate, but that's besides the point. But although I am saying up to six trips, it is the chairman who sanctions the director's trip per year for interest. And chairman's trips do get sanctioned by the secretary. It doesn't go anymore to the minister which of course is a big relief because once it goes to the minister then you know I mean basically you know you don't pick up the cell phone like you do for secretary to talk to him you have to talk to his PAS and then he half the time is not in the ministry he is maybe I mean our minister comes from Chennai half the time is Chennai so all sorts of problems so that is no more there then the biggest problem in PSU was the decision for investments most of them had to go right up to Cabinet Committee of Economic Affairs headed by none other than the Prime Minister. And the process was, after it got approved by the board, it used to go to the Ministry, then there used to be a meeting which was known as Pre-PIB, Public Investment Board Meeting, which was uh, taken by the Additional Secretary and Financial Advisor of our Ministry with the presence of Finance Ministry, Planning Commission, etc. Then ultimately the PIB meeting, Public Investment Board meeting. And after PIB approved it, it went to Cabinet. Cabinet Committee of Economic Affairs. So it used to take a long time. We had seen that uh, minimum time taken after the board decision was 6 months. Maximum at times was 18 months. So many projects lost their you know, you know, uh, purpose. Now today SCI is a Navaratna company. You are conferred the Navaratna status on 1st of August 2008. So today for investment decision our board is completely autonomous. Whether it is 1000 crores, 5000 crores, I mean, there is no limit. As long as it is in the line of business, as long as it is I mean, something which, I mean, I know Navaratna guidelines you know, prescribe many things, but I suppose they are all very very valid in the sense that even private sector should do it that way that any project should be appraised by an independent you know, consultant. It should not be only done by the insiders, etc. Et so with that, we are completely autonomous. The selection, of course, I did mention in some other context. The selection of board level directors and chairman takes place by public enterprise selection board, which is headed by some ex-secretary. And the members are also usually either ex-secretaries or sometimes ex-CMDs of public sector like that. The government uh, nominates normally two directors on the board. I mean, on our board, it is the additional secretary and joint secretary shipping. They are the uh, board nominees. And since we are listed PSU, 
As per the SEBI guideline, since it is headed by me, who is a functional director and being the chairman and director, 50% of the directorship have to be with independent directors who do not belong to the proponents. So we have as many as eight independent directors. We have one of the possibly best boards amongst PSUs. I mean, uh, we have Professor Gokul Dolakia, who was the, was the we have Naseem Munji, who was uh, IFCI and the director and also HDFC, etc. We have uh, the ex-chairman and managing director of Bharat Petroleum, ex-chairman and managing director of Ingenious India Limited. We have three ex-secretaries, Tarun Mago, who was the chief secretary of government of Maharashtra as well as chairman of Mumbai Trust. Shushil Tripathi was secretary of Petroleum time of the superannuation and one Mr. Srivastava who was agriculture executive and we have a business person from Chennai who is in many trawler business export of uh, seafoods etc. So uh, this is our independent directors we have five functional directors in addition to myself so six working directors two nominees from the government and eight independent directors. For the last 16 years, we have been signing what is known as Memorandum of Understanding, specifying the performance parameters for the company with the government. Again, taking some pride, I have, if I may say so, that for the last 16 years, SCI has been at just excellent under the FWAB. And the government has a scheme for giving more autonomy to many of the public sectors who are first, uh, you know, some of them are rated as mini ratna, we wear a mini ratna earlier, where the board level autonomy is up to 500 crores. And then Navaratna, as I said, as far as investments are concerned, they are completely free. They are totally autonomous. We have guidelines being issued by Department of Public Enterprise, Central Vigilance Commission, Ministry of Finance, etc. So this, in a way, you can say that you know, our entire governance system is far more involved, to some extent maybe more strenuous time consuming. Because first and foremost, being a listed company, we have to comply in any case with all the SEBI guidelines. We have all the committee on the board, we have all, I mean, all the respective committees of the board as prescribed by SEBI and the statutory auditor, etc. But on top of all that, we have Comptroller and Auditor General, CAG also are seen all of it. We have, of course, as required independent director, uh, sorry, uh, internal auditor. And uh, so basically, one does feel that to some extent in ESU there are duplications. Because after all, if CB guidelines are considered to be adequate for private sector, there is no reason being in the same kind of industry, in the same atmosphere, why we need, you know, beyond that something else. It does create some problem at times. But anyway, that is something which we have to tackle. And another very big problem which has come up for the last about three years is this right to information act. Of course, you know, if you really, if you really spend time with the act and really prepare yourself, Many of the questions of any commercial sensitivity you need not reply. But for that, you really have to do a lot of homework. And I have seen that whether it is the Chief Information Commissioner or Chief Vigilance Commissioner, anyone reaching that level are always extremely pragmatic. You can definitely, you know, if you feel there is some genuine difficulty, you can definitely convince them of that. But the problem actually arises with people down below. And that's why many a times you have to actually refer the matter to the right of the government. Yeah. Yeah, this is from a student sitting in the other class. Uh, Sorry, question. Yeah. Uh, he wants to know uh, what is your stance on the Ram Sethu controversy? When this issue was hot, did you face any differences of opinion from your colleagues? How did you manage this phase? You see, 
As far as SCI is concerned, SCI has only contributed 50 crores as an equity investor into the Setu Samudra project. When this, uh, when this proposal came from government to SCI, which is very unusual, I mean, our proposals are always all, I mean, originated in the organization, but in this particular case, it was the ministry who, are, who was very much interested and the proposal came from the government for SCI investing 50 crores. Our board raised number of questions about economic viability and you know this matter you know just sort of <coughs> went to and fro between our board and the ministry at least five times. But one thing one has to admit that after all 80.12% stakeholder being the government, if they really want, you know, our turnover last year was 4,500 crores, if they really want SCI to make an investment of 50 crores, then ultimately you cannot say no. So yes, we have invested 50 crores, though I have got my, got my grave doubts as to how successful this project will be because they were aiming for 12 meter draft. Now this 12 meter draft is just just not adequate for any modern talent. So it doesn't really serve any problems. But nevertheless, the project in any case now is completely stalled. You know, none other than the Chiori's committee is looking at the alignment and things like that. So we don't know what will be the ultimate Supreme Court verdict, how it will progress, we have absolutely no idea. But we accepting being, you know, I mean I am a director, unfortunately these meetings are held in Chennai and I mean, maybe one out of ten meetings I can actually attend. Because something or the other always clashes I've seen. But other than that, we have got very limited role. We are not involved in the project, excepting as equity parts to the extent of the groups. Okay. Corporate governance, because of various I mean, matters which I have already mentioned, corporate governance is something which is very strong in, his, I mean, in any public sector. Of course. As far as uh, corporate governance is concerned, it basically started with Enron, Global Corp, and all that. I mean, holding up and then SOX, servants of the USA, UK, India. We have the Clause 49 as per the CV. So, uh, corporate governance today is uh, vital importance. But just like any other private sector, we have all the corporate governance through, you know, through independent directors, through audit committee, and everything in place. Over and above, we are also subjected to these, you know, special CEs, CBC, CAG, so which makes our corporate governance even stronger. PSU, of course, operate as you know, as we have already mentioned in more of poor infrastructure, so-called old economy. You know, industry is not really in IT and. Uh, there, there was one IT company, but that also is now all under the fold of Tata. And uh, ESU versus private companies, I think I have already mentioned enough. So I won't like to mention anything more there. An executive in ESU, as far as, you know, I keep saying that as far as the managers, the executives, and the management is concerned, whether the shares are held by government or by any other promoter, unless the promoter, you know, is a sort of hands-on, which happens more in the case of private sector rather than private uh, public sector, should make hardly any difference. We are all professionals. We are trying to do the best for the organization in terms of growth, in terms of top line, bottom line, and also, of course, today, that's not good enough. We also have to take care of CSR and everything else. But anyway, basically as a private sector executive, I have found that there is a general perception that in public sector, the decisions are taken higher up in the hierarchy. Usually the junior executives, they do not have much of decision making powers. Now I have seen almost the opposite in the sense I have seen that in public sector one thing I must admit 
that in public sector, if you look at the percentage of executives who are really dedicated, focused, have the competencies, possibly you will find that is lower than the private sector. More so because when public sector was established, that was established with one idea of generating employment. And in any public sector which is established for the last 30, 40, 50 years, you will find there are a large percentage of employees who are really risen from ranks, they are not professionals. But they are there. I am not saying they don't contribute or they are not been contributing. But still, the so-called you know, firefighters, the so-called I mean, the percentage of people who really slog is possibly lower in public sector than in private sector. And as a result of this, if a person is really focused and he wants to work, more and more comes on his plate. And automatically decisions also are made by him. Maybe ultimately some signature is there for, for, from someone. I remember as a very junior executive, I used to, even before my superior officer, saw the correspondence or you know, I mean, internal communications, etc. I used to study, I used to prepare the replies and put it up to him. And 99% case there was not, not even an error, I mean, the world was being changed. So actually if you want to work and if you want to make decisions, I think in public sector you are even allowed more at a junior position than by us. So again I think that perception that in public sector, junior executives hardly matter, is completely wrong. Basically, when you join an organization, you are learning the ropes of the organization, gathering information. But once you start developing yourself and you really know well of the job, then you start learning about the entire industry, you learn learning about your competitors. Basically, you know, competence, this word I have used more than once, Competence consists of not only of your knowledge, your intuition. I mean, again, some other, I think that was the uh, book, it was, I think, Gopala Krishna's, that Bonsai Manager, the case of the Bonsai Manager. He has given a very nice uh, thing between knowledge and intuition. He has said knowledge is something that you know that you know. Intuition is something that you don't know that you know. And intuitive decisions are also completely based on you know, knowledge, experience and very many things. Only thing it is, it is taken so fast that you don't really analyze and then know that why you have decided. That's all is the difference. So competence consists of knowledge, skills which you develop by applying your knowledge to the given circumstances. But above all, it also includes attitude. And I have all along maintained that a person who is little less skilled, who doesn't have so much experience, but has a real positive attitude, can contribute far more to his organization than a highly knowledgeable and highly skilled person who has a negative attitude. Yes? Uh, sir, it is being told that if you, uh, if someone wants job stability, uh, he should join uh, PSU. Uh, but then uh, uh, there are times when the, in the private sector, if you are not productive, they immediately fire. Uh, so why, why, if a person is not productive, the company is kept in a public, yet he is kept in a public sector and not fired if he is not productive for the company? In government or public sector, the concept of firing is not there. It is there as per rules. As per rules, definitely a public sector can sack a person on the ground of inefficiency alone. I have never seen in my career it happening ever. I have worked as Jyotir said for more than 36 years. And I am sure the same is the case with any other public sector. In public sector people get sacked only because of corruption, vigilance issues etc but never because of pure inefficiency. Now this is, this is you know, something that the philosophy in public sector, as I said, public sector was created for you know, creation of jobs. 
So definitely that philosophy has, has uh, been retained. But again, you are purely talking of stability. I am sure, you know, whether it is me or I mean, uh, most or all of you, as long as you are a good productive person, I don't think in private sector anybody will consider getting rid of you because after all that, is, that will not be in their interest. So stability in the sense that yes, if you sometimes, if you are, if you make a mistake, possibly a public sector always turns out to be a more benevolent, you know, more tolerant employer than in many other private sectors. So that's about it. Yeah. So as you describe the environment in the PSU, it seems to be very lenient. And now you are on the, in the top management. Now how difficult is it for you to uh, to control the uh, the operations on the lower end? So I, I, I won't say it is lenient. All that I will say that yes.